Hello everybody, I'm Pastor Max Lynn and I am, I'm on the rooftop of St. John's Presbyterian Church and we are just after Earth Day so I thought it be, might be nice to get up here and see the sky and the mountains and the solar panels up here. I'll ask you to uh, take a moment, sit up straight. Relax your jaw. Release your tongue down to the bottom of your mouth. Breathe deep through your nose. Relax your shoulders down. Release your breath. In stressful t situations, we tend to hold things tight, both physically and mentally. We tend to go grip onto the immediate issues and become myopic in our point of view. We lose the big picture. There's an image from the book of Revelation. We just had Davy read chapter 21, verses 1 through 5 where it speaks of a new heaven and a new earth and no more sea. If it was literal, I would have a problem with that. Even as we know that sea is life-giving and that's certainly an archetype and a metaphor that the sea, the ocean, and water are life-giving, life-renewing and sustaining. We can understand how it's all also almost a universal archetype for a stormy, violent, dark, chaotic forces of life and death. As a lifeguard and surfer, I have had the unfortunate opportunity to see the look on people's faces as they were drowning, as I was going to save them. Drowning is essentially panic in water. People are so focused on the fear of loss of control, on what they cannot do, and what they think they must do, that they can't think clearly about what they can do. A couple of times I've had to actually shake people and try to get them to look me in the eye to try to pull them out of that myopic, terrified, and panicked mind. Almost all human bodies can float, but people get so rigid and tense in their fight to breathe and stay afloat that they sink. Ocean Beach is known for being one of the most difficult places in the world to paddle out into to go surfing. With all the water moving in and out of the bay from San, San Jose to Sacramento, in and out through the Golden Gate, there's all those currents that are swirling back and forth and then you have big ocean swells from the open sea. It is very complex and dynamic. Recently, I was speaking with uh, my son Kevin's, one of my son, son's friends, and he was mentioning that as he learned how to surf in Southern California and then came up to San Francisco, he had to learn that paddling as hard as you can and as fast as you can is not always the quick, quickest way out into the ocean. He had to learn that sometimes muscling and fighting and resisting was not what was called for. Sometimes it doesn't matter whether you're an Olympic swimmer, you might find yourself out of energy and knocked back to shore. Rather than focus on your own ability and your own strength or your inability and your weakness, 
You need to expand your focus beyond yourself. Look out at all that's happening around you. And when you hear the ocean and nature call your name, and you see it open a gate, you follow and step on through. Sometimes it's best when you're in an overwhelming situation to sit back and save energy and wait for an opening. You learn to take what life will give you, no more and no less. There's also a lesson in humility, humility to be learned from virtually everyone that surfs Ocean Beach. You may start your 300-yard paddle out right next to somebody, and then they get hit by a wave or two or ten, or caught in a swirling riptide. And the next thing you know, they're 50 yards further out you're 50 yards further out than they are. It's very tempting at that spot to think, oh, I'm a really good surfer, I'm super strong, and I know what I'm doing. And to think that the other guy's just a kook. But just as soon as you think that, about how good and strong you are, you get smashed and caught in a rip yourself. And the person who, has 50, who was 50 yards behind you is all of a sudden now 50 yards ahead of you. I mean, it's really common, really common to make a, a hundred yard switch in transition in just a minute or two. So you resist focusing on how great you are and how much force you can exert or how bad you are and how terrible, uh, how much terrible trouble you're in. It's not that you resist thinking about yourself entirely. Rather, you realize that your effort, your power, is only a small part of all the power that is around you. So you begin to relax into the breath and flow so that you can expand your point of view. It's much less about fighting the ocean than discovering what the ocean is doing and working with it in synchronicity with it, taking what it gives you. Perhaps as we consider this uh, Earth Day 2020 during the coronavirus, it is an appropriate analogy to think of ourselves as being smashed by a set of waves and caught in a rip current, so that rather than fight and tough guy it through, as if faith only meant pushing forward and showing how tough we are to show up at worship with a bunch of people, that we are called by God to just sit back and wait. And we are to resist the temptation of thinking that we are better than others or in the clear and letting our guard down because we just might get hit by the next wave of the disease. Humility is constantly an aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's very, under, very easy right now, I think, to understand how and why we want to and that we think we should need to aggressively attack nature. It's easy to see it as something to resist and overcome something to tame and place under our dominion. With all the labor that is, it has taken most of the people for the history of the world to survive, with bugs to attack our crops, lions and bears and hurricanes and storms and disease to attack our bodies, 
it's understandable that we would have developed a point of view that we were in competition with nature and other human beings. And there's no question that as we decided to use our minds and reason to solve problems we so frequently face as humans trying to survive, to use the God-given gifts of our mind, a great deal of good has been accomplished. The harnessing of power, especially through uh, the burning of fossil fuels, has helped lead to an incredible improvement and extension of the human lifespan. We have produced faster and cheap goods uh, and items that we need or are useful faster and cheaper than ever, decreasing the cost to the consumer. Food, clothing, housing, shoes, tools, all became, for the most part, better and less expensive. We have air conditioning for hot climates and heat for cold. We have clothes, washers, dishwashers, ovens, wells, dams for water, fertilizer and pesticide for crops, and thousands and thousands of other things. Saving time and labor, labor made room for more education, and education in turn increased creativity and the ways people could earn a living. So employment opportunities increased. Medicine, of course, namely the discovery of, of, of germs and, and of antibiotics, also expanded life expectancy greatly. And think of all of the different uh, uh, machines in the hospital that are made from petroleum products. Uh, there's almost everything, right? And of course, there's transportation in the, in the advancement of shipping and trains and automobiles and airplanes. It increased our ability to move goods and services to help people stay alive and be comfortable and, and enjoy life uh, across broad, um, you know, across the whole planet. Indeed, our lives have been improved in many, many ways. Life expectancy has moved from, from around 40 in the United States at 1900 to near 80 now. Now the world seems so big that we didn't think that we could ever destroy it. I don't think people set out thinking, oh, we're going to destroy all the trees and, and, and ruin uh, the natural world. Um, I think it was just a confusion, not a confusion, but an ignorance and an arrogance. But as we became more successful at staying alive, more successful at extracting goods, population expanded exponentially, and now we're being hit by wave after wave of problems. We have the overcrowding of cities, poor working conditions, pollution of the air, land, rivers, oceans, biodiversity decline, unhealthy habits, water scarcity, rising temperatures, melting icebergs, rising seas, increasing storms, increasing drought, increased violent and exploitative competition for resources, resistance to new and uh, resistant and new diseases. We thought we were super strong and better than other cultures, and now we are being knocked back and humbled by the ray waves and rip currents of nature. In this dangerous sea, knocked under by the waves and problems, we fear drowning. We are tempted to fight, to struggle and grip and lash out even at those who are trying to help us. We shorten our breath, hyperventilate, trying to get air, and resist doing anything different. But now is the time to stop, to expand our point of view, to look around at what's happening and see what Mother Nature wants to give us and what we need to sit back and pull back and rest and relax 
and take it in. Now is the time to learn to live in synchronicity with nature, with a whole new world, a new heaven, and a new earth. Now the folks to whom John was writing to when he wrote his revelations, or sent his revelation, were in a very similar situation in many ways with their hopes and dreams being hit over and over by wave after wave of problems. Now they were poor and oppressed in a political, in socially, economically, and politically in a way that virtually almost none of us um, are. But the letter also reflects an extreme upheaval in nature as well. Revelations was written to Christians in Asia Minor or modern day Turkey near or shortly after the end of the reign of Domitian, Emperor Domitian of Rome, between 90, 96, or 100 um, CE, the Common Era. Now, 30 years earlier, in the year 70, The Roman Empire just destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And thousands, tens of thousands of refugees, Christian and Jewish, moved up into, as immigrants, into Asia Minor. So they're already, as we hear in uh, the, the uh, uh, letter of Peter, resident aliens, aliens and strangers. But also Rome was at war almost all the time, not just with Israel, but with, with, uh, but with, people, with other peoples all along, conquering them and losing some. They lost to the Parthians. The horrible, beastly, ter uh, beastly tyrant Nero persecuted Christians along with many other, others, blaming the fire in Rome on them. After Nero died in 68, there wasn't a stabilization, but, but uh, people fighting for uh, rivalries to the throne were killing each other, and uh, year after year, it was a turnover and just madness. So here we have the powerful who have all the wealth and power to be happy, and what, what are they doing? The worldly, the worldly people at that are top of the world are just killing each other and killing their children and killing their wives or they're, I mean, killing all sorts of people, just anybody. They're not happy people, even though they have everything. And they were also wreaking havoc on the poor. And then there was earthquakes devastated Asia Minor in the 60s. And in 68, the volcano Vesuvius erupted, burying Pompeii and dropping down, raining down balls of fire on surrounding towns and covering the whole empire in a big black cloud of dust and darkness. The emperor Domitian, you know, in the, in the 90s as well, there was a severe famine, so people are starving to death as well. And the Emperor Domination uh, outlawed Christianity in the empire and persecuted Christians. Christians were social outcasts, marginalized immigrants, refugees that people said, get out of here, we don't like you. And, and, and they were easy scapegoats for uh, various problems. And when one was accused, they were tortured and others were given up. And if they didn't give up, if they didn't confess that they would worship the emperor of Rome and the Roman gods, then they were, they were, they were, they were murdered. So in this stormy sea of chaos, John writes to Christians to take a breath, to step back and look at the larger picture of things so they won't drown in panic and despair. Christians may be taking a beating, John said. But ultimately, God is in charge. God was here in the beginning, and God is going to be here in the end. 
from the gospel, from the teachings of the death, the teachings and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that God dwells with us. She is the lifeguard, the good shepherd, as the Gospel of John says. And God dwells with, we, with us and we dwell with God. We are God's people. And in the long run, we can trust God is with us and will wipe away every tear. And there will be no more crying and no more pain and no more sea. For all this crazy violence and injustice and disease and death will pass away. The intent of the letter is to get Christians to resist the temptation to grasp and grab, to stiffen up and think they are judged unworthy because they are caught in the chaotic rip current of violence and disaster. <clears throat> Don't lose hope. Remember that God specializes in bringing good out of bad. The crazy, amazing thing is that it worked. Hope from the resurrection of Christ gave Christians faith that there was in indeed, indeed a hope that surpasses understanding. There is indeed a larger picture. And this poor and oppressed group went from anxious and afraid to assured and assertive. From sad and weak to joyful and defiant. They went from wanting to hide, hide out, and give up to being tenacious and courageous. They went from being locked down and oppressed to being opened up and free. They went from being powerless to being powerful, from being upset to being unstoppable. Those followers of Christ, poor and oppressed and persecuted and outlawed by the most powerful empire on the earth, overcame and outlasted that empire. Behold, I am making all things new. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen.